And then I'll say welcome again to everyone who is arriving and hello, a double welcome for everyone who already received a welcome a moment ago. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about how do we, and I don't just mean we as in a generic we or the royal we, how do we navigate emergence together? And I love to share while, while others may still be arriving that in the host call this week, and a few of you are on the host team I see here, um, we grappled with a specific tension, which was that I had foreshadowed earlier in the process that we would be doing pro-social this week. That we'd be learning about pro-social, that that would be coming next. But what's happened is that, as always happens in the host team of these learning journeys, we really pay attention to what is emerging and what is present and what's happening. And then we try to feel into what we think is actually the most helpful. Oh yes, and um, John, I believe you have some sound there and if you could mute, that would be very helpful. Uh, thank you. Hey, hey Joe, sorry for interrupting. Can you make me a co-host and then I can take care of muting people who yeah. are Oh yes, of course. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. There you sure. are. See how easy it is to allocate power. If anyone else wants power, please take it. I, I don't <laughs> want it. <laughs> Um, I want to create a power, power outage and send it out to all of you. So anyway, um, what happened in the host team call was we were talking about the delicate nature of all of the strong feelings that were coming up and how we could sense into this meshing of how complex all of our feelings are about what is happening in the world and how disorienting it is, how it's hard really Honestly, it's hard to know how to feel from moment to moment. It's like, here's yet another, you know, severe climate event creating some quote unquote natural disaster. Here's some political farce. Here's something happening in the economy. I'm using cryptocurrency and it crashed this, way, like, et cetera, et cetera. There's like so much disorienting stuff. And so in general, we're disoriented. And specifically within our group and our own process, we could all sense that things were stirred up by the webinar that I gave last week and that we were sort of already preemptively stirred up, but then we stirred ourselves some more. And so we're in this place of feeling into the unknown and it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable because there's danger. It's uncomfortable because it's unfamiliar. It's uncomfortable because some of us are grappling with bigger changes than we thought we would have to reckon with. Like one of, member of our host team, Marceau, beautifully role modeled vulnerability in talking about the tension he has in himself about whether cities can ever be sustainable and whether he should give up on cities or not and how he's not decided. But wow, that's a tough one. That's a really tough one. And we just all agreed on the host team, please stay with that discomfort. Keep exploring that. We're not gonna push for one side or the other, just keep exploring that, that's so important. And so it really felt important for us as the host team to agree that we would blend a little bit of pro-social into today. But really today is about a topic I studied in graduate school. How do patterns form in complex systems? And later when I got into embodied cognition and embodiment, what does it feel like to be inside patterns as they're forming? What does it feel like to be disoriented by change? And so the topic today is really about that. And so what I'd love to do is just jump right into the presentation part so that I can try and stir things up a little bit for us and get us into some nice discussion afterwards. So with that in mind, I'll share my screen. And here we go. So the question is, how do we navigate emergence together? And I saw this image as just a nice example of what emergence intuitively feels like. Just even if you haven't studied what emergence is, you can sense that if something is emerging, that it's dynamic and changing, that there's something that came before and something that comes next. 
And just like this, this is a computer simulated fractal that you can look into its lines and shapes and start to find more texture. You can start to find more details. You can start to find surprises, which means even with this image here, there are a lot of unknowns. And this image is actually part of the famous Mandelbrot set um, discovered by Benoit Mandelbrot is one of the creators of, of fractal geometry. And what's interesting is you can zoom into this forever and it'll keep having complexity emerge. So the unknown is endless in this fractal, and which is just an interesting thing to try and wrap your head around because what, what an insight into the unfolding cosmos, the unfolding universe is infinitely unraveling into new unknowns. And what does it feel like for us, people who may have been born into a false sense of security about a normal world? I know for me, when I was a kid, I thought I was gonna go to college maybe. I mean, I was a poor working class kid, the first in my family to go to college. So I was not certain I would go to college. But I was like, maybe I'll get to go to college. I might get to do some world travel. I might have a really cool job someday. I had a sense of the world that I was given as a child would be the world that made sense as an adult. And it turned out the world is changing too quickly for that. And for those of you who are younger than me, I'm 45. For those of you who are younger than me, the world's changing even faster for you because it's speeding up. And so the, the invitation for this learning journey has been, what if we climb out of this cave that pretends the world is normal? What if we climb out of that and go see what the world really looks like? And what happens to us emotionally when we do that? And I wanna put in context here that our planet is 4.56 billion years old. There has been life continuously on this planet for between 3.6 and 3.8 billion years. Humans have been around as homo sapiens for somewhere around 300,000 or 400,000 years, a blink, a blip. And yet, we are living right now in a moment that is unprecedented in the history of our species and the history of the planet. There's only been one time before where a category of species caused a mass extinction event, which was the cyanobacteria, phytoplankton, which excreted oxygen and filled the atmosphere with toxic oxygen. But it wasn't a single organism, it wasn't a single species, it was a category of species, it was a variety of them. And here we are, the first species, the first singular species in the history of the planet to destabilize the entire planetary system and move us into what may become a full on mass extinction event. And the thing is, since we have never had this, this context before, our evolutionary history prepared us for a different context than this. So we don't know if we are prepared for the context we're in. And it's that large in scale. This is planetary. This is cosmic in scale, this event that we're in. And we simply cannot know what will happen next. You don't even know what I'm going to put on the next slide. We cannot know what will happen next. But also, can you trust that your life partner you've been with for years is still going to be there next year? Can you trust that your children are going to stay close to where you live or move farther away? Can you trust that your friends are going to understand how you think and feel as you go further and further into collapse awareness, as you go further and further into accepting the reality of how the planet is? Can you really trust that the economy is going to hold you, that the work you do now is the work that you could even possibly do in six months? We simply cannot know what will happen next. Now, it turns out there's a whole realm of studying and dynamic systems about stability and instability. So we can actually predict very well what cannot happen next, which in this case is what came before. What came before cannot happen next. The way the world was cannot be the way the world will be. This is very disorienting. It's very confusing and it creates a lot of stress. And so what I wanna ask you is how do patterns like this emerge? And yes, I've shown this, this uh, image before in the, 
section in the webinar on cultural scaffolding. But I want you to ask yourself, imagine, <coughs> excuse me, imagine that these patterns that are emerging are patterns of human relationships instead of slime mold uh, that are linking to each other. Imagine this is a web of human relationships. How does it feel to be inside this pattern as it's emerging? How does it feel to be one of those threads that's forming or breaking? How does it feel to be inside a pattern that's emerging that you cannot predict what will happen next? This is something we need to pay attention with our bodies and learn how to feel into better. I would suggest that it feels something like this, that there's confusion and doubt, anxiety, despair, fear, all kinds of troubling, unpleasant things, which causes us to seek false hope and bring those feelings to an end, to avoid and deny the reality of what's causing those things, to fall into unhelpful habits simply because they're familiar, but they don't actually help us, to fall into turbulence and stability, which reactivates all those negative feelings and then cling to the past as though it's going to be the future. And we can see around us lots of examples of people doing this right now. And if we look at ourselves, honestly, I have done every one of these things and I will again. And I will again. And so how does it feel to be inside the pattern in an unprecedented moment of planetary history? Unfortunately, a lot of the time it feels like this. And we gotta get out of this because there is no future in this. Right, this way of feeling is not gonna get us where we need to go. Luckily, we have friends who can help us. We don't have to go through this alone. That's the whole point of these learning journeys and the main purpose of Earth Regenerators. How do we create social supports to each other as we feel lost or in despair, confused and anxious, as we go back to old habits that we know we shouldn't and we're embarrassed or humiliated? How do, we, how do we find the social supports and the safe spaces when those unpleasant and icky feelings come up? What is that like when we actually can help each other? How do we get to a place where we trust and know each other well enough that these social supports are real and present anytime we need them? Well, the feeling of emergence is like being in a labyrinth to be inside a pattern you cannot fully see. If you're inside the labyrinth, all you can see is the turns that are in front of you and a few of the turns that were behind you, but you can't see the whole labyrinth, which means you're very alert, you're very aware, and therefore you're getting tired because you're using up energy. And you might not make very many mistakes in the beginning, but you know what happens when you get tired? you're gonna get clumsy and you're gonna start making mistakes. So to be inside a pattern you cannot fully see is to be in a pattern of diminishing capacities. Unless you know how to find your way through the pattern. And how do we find our way through a maze? We discover boundaries of possibility by interacting with the maze. We interact with it by making choices and moving around. Exploring and getting familiar, <laughs> getting familiar with it. We discover boundaries not by staying still, but by navigating the maze. And this is the secret to how we get out of those feelings, is we interact with the systems that we're a part of, even though we cannot fully see them. And in the webinar today, I want to share a little bit about how you can start to see the invisible parts of these systems. So what are the capacities that I'll need to get through this? See, this is the same, the same woman who was stuck in all those chaotic feelings, but now look at her closer. She seemed like she was such a mess, didn't she? In that previous slide, this is the same photo, but I've taken that context of misery and confusion away and look at her concentrating. Look at the peacefulness and the focus in her face. She's finding the capacities that she needs, which come in two forms. We have to learn how to see the systems that we're in, which is not natural. They're not automatically there. We have to do the work of finding 
how they are and what they are. And then we must remain flexible and open to changing ourselves as those systems change. For those of you who are familiar with Nora Bateson's work, this will sound very familiar. This is the space where there's no separation between the system and the observer. You are part of the system touching and feeling it, getting wet, getting dirty, getting tired. The system is you and you are part of the system. So we have to learn to see the systems we're in, but somehow remain flexible and open to change so that we can learn how to dance with the system, to play with the system, to joke and tease and flirt with the system, to work with the system. Whatever the system requires and whatever we require, these are the capacities that we will need. One of the key aspects of the work in pro-social comes out of a field known as contextual behavioral science. And it's a specific framework called acceptance and commitment therapy. And it's okay if you don't remember all of that. The thing about acceptance and commitment therapy is it's based on an understanding, a huge body of research that shows people how to change their own behaviors. And it turns out the psychological flexibility or the, the psychological foundations of this ability to change yourself are in the ability to regulate your emotions moment to moment and the ability to remain psychologically flexible or to say in another way, the ability to change your perspective, which requires you to regulate your emotions. So these two capacities are interdependent. If you start to become really scared, you're gonna have a hard time changing your point of view updating your mindset with new information, and so on. If you're really excited, you're gonna have a hard time slowing down to see the details that you might have missed and update your understanding of what the system is doing. There's a beautiful body of research on how people make errors, make catastrophic errors, when they're making decisions in the face of complexity. And it turns out there's one observable behavior that indicates success at managing complexity. That one observable behavior is that you continue asking questions, that you continue updating your mental representation of the system that you're in, because the system that you're in is changing. So whatever model you have is based on the past and the past is different from the future. So if you remain in a mode of inquiry, which means you manage your emotions and you remain psychologically flexible and you continually learn from the system, then you can navigate from the present to the future. And pro-social training helps us to build these capacities to do this, which is why we feel it's so important to learn more about that as we go. But I simply wanna point out now that this is a core focus of regenerative work. If we cannot cultivate this in ourselves, we cannot cultivate it in landscapes and ecosystems because we just won't stay with the open-ended work of evolving ourselves with those evolving landscapes. So the real focus is on us as we navigate all these changes. And just to name briefly, the pro-social framework has three, uh, three foundational pillars, and we'll be talking about more of this later. But this is an integration of many different bodies of research. It's not a framework. It's many different bodies of knowledge. But the foundational pillars are that there's a set of core design principles for managing a commons, and every human group is a commons. That there's this work in contextual behavioral science, like what I was just showing about which core psychological capacities are needed and how to cultivate them. And there's a very large body of research in the evolution of cooperation in all living systems. And when you start to navigate across these bodies of knowledge, you start to find out how to see the systems you're embedded in and co-evolve with them while evolving your own emotional responses as you go, which is extremely important because your internal body dynamic is part of the context you're in. And anyone who does mindfulness work knows exactly what I'm talking about. So part of how we learn how to navigate emergence together is we learn how to see the system that we're in and then we be embedded, our way of being is to embed ourselves consciously and actively, to know our own embeddedness, so that our bodies become sense-making tools to feel the emerging of that system. We feel what's changing because it's changing us and we can feel how we're changing. And if we do this in groups, 
we can discern together, like the famous story of the three blind men and the elephant. Each of us may feel the emerging for different parts of what's happening. And if we have good trust and good communication, our collective sense making goes up. And if our collective sense making goes up, so does our individual sense making. If I practice discerning the system together with you, my ability goes up and so does yours. And so we grow our skills. But that also means we become scaffolds to each other and we become scaffolds for ourselves as this process continues. And this means we heal as we go because some of what we feel emerging hurts us and we have to recover. Some of what we feel emerging helps us to heal better. Some of what we feel emerging actually directly heals us, but it's a mix. At any moment, it might be all of those at the same time. You might be healing, feeling how you need to heal and, be, and get hurt all in different ways at the same time. If you can imagine how confusing that would be. And so this is our general process for how we navigate emergence is we start to see the system as though it's a mental object. Then we practice embedding ourselves into it and feel into what that's like so we can feel the emerging, feel the changing that's happening in that system and then get better and better at discerning it so that we become healthier. And as a result, if we are healthier within the system, the system itself is healthier. If that system is a watershed, if that system is a local economy, if that system is a co-housing or an intentional community, whatever system we're a part of will become healthier as we heal and as we discern the emerging within it. But notice that the instrument of choice for this, the key tool that you use is your body. Your body, which has a dynamic mind, is what is embedded in feeling and discerning and scaffolding. It's your body. Your body is the focus of this work. This is why I do morning mindfulness and movement therapy. This is why I do work on the land with my body every day to help me feel what's emerging and to feel where I need to heal and to feel where the land and the community need to heal. And it's my body that is doing it. And it's your body that is doing it. Nobody tells us this, that regenerating the earth is to learn how to integrate our body and our body's sense-making into a web of relationships as the patterns are emerging. But that's exactly what we do. So there's a bubbling and a churning on the edge of invisibility. Fun fact, Joe B studied cloud formation in graduate school. I studied how clouds form. It's turned out to be really useful here in Barichara as I watch the patterns of weather and look at where landscapes need to be regenerated to design for changes in the weather because this is a place that's becoming a desert and I don't want it to. But what I want you to notice is the edge of this cloud. Look at any edge piece that you want. And what you'll see is there's an invisible part that you can't see and stuff is emerging or stuff is going away. Which means in that space that you can't see, there's something happening. There's something happening, but you can't see it. I'm gonna let you in on why that is. It's because your eyes evolved to have a very limited bandwidth of electromagnetic frequency that the rods and cones in your eyes are sensitive to. And this is what we call the visible part of the spectrum. What you cannot see here is the heat exchange of evaporation as the liquid cloud is turning into a gas cloud, as liquid water is becoming water vapor, which is what is bubbling away as that cloud dissipates. And as the cloud spreads, what's happening is water vapor is condensing into liquid and making liquid water droplets, which means there's water vapor outside of the visible spectrum of radiation, which means your eyes can't see it. There's something mixing in that space that's invisible that is making the cloud. Now that little insight lets us look at a larger scale to start practicing how do we see what is invisible that is creating the patterns that are emerging. And one way 
is by learning the logic of the system. And here is the logic of radiative transfer and thermodynamic mixing for water in the atmosphere as water changes from liquid to gas. And that's thermodynamics and radiation because the heat of the sun is adding energy to the system and the heat arrives as radiation, as electromagnetic energy. Now look, if we look at this on a larger scale, these are two images taken this morning from the GOES satellite, which is a, geo a geospatial referencing satellite that sits at the same point in space, up in a little place in space where it turns with the surface of the earth. So it's always looking at the same place. And this is data that is used to create weather forecasts. The image on the top is in the water vapor absorption channel. What that means is the satellite detector is seeing things your eyes cannot because it's detecting information outside of the visible range. It's detecting where water is in vapor form and the darker blue and yellow are higher concentrations of moisture in the air. The image on the bottom is from the same satellite with a different sensor looking at the visible part of the spectrum, which is what your eyes could see. And the reason you can't see anything across North America is because it's still night. This is sunrise for the East Coast. Because it's still nighttime, there's no visible data for you to see. But as you can see in the image at the top, there's infrared information for measuring water vapor across the entire space because it doesn't depend on it being visible light. And what I want you to notice is if you look at the top image where the front line of blue is pushing east, and then look at the bottom image, you'll see that where the dark blue and the white touch each other is where the weather is forming. That's where the clouds are being created. The mixing of moist and dry air is where the clouds form. So if you're only looking with your eyes, all you'll see is clouds forming as if from nowhere. But if you look at water vapor, you'll see that it's the pushing of moist air that rises up over dry air until the, the vapor rises to an, where it's cold enough that it chills and becomes liquid. It goes from a gas to a liquid as it rises up. It's basically one surface here and it pushes up it until it gets high enough that it's cold. It condenses and it forms a cloud. Now, if you understand the physics involved in this, you will be able to see what is invisible. You'll be able to create an instrument that can measure it. In this case, an infrared absorption channel and a geospatial satellite. And then when you create that instrument, it will see what your eyes can't see. And then you use a computer to visualize it for you. And the computer becomes a new set of eyes. In the same way, every other pattern that is emerging, that is invisible to us, has a logic to it. It has mechanisms and processes that you can learn how to see. When I was in graduate school and I took weather forecasting classes, and atmospheric dynamics classes and cloud physics classes and radiative transfer classes. These were graduate school atmospheric science classes. I learned how to see this. And now I can see the clouds and I can tell you where the moisture is and where the dry air is in the empty air between. Because I have looked in, in enough of these satellite images that my brain knows how to see the invisible part. And now I can see the invisible part because I understand how it works. And this is really important. A lot of what is invisible is only invisible because we do not have the conceptual perspective that lets us see it. Part of how we feel the emerging is to create sense-making in our bodies. And this is why we use satellite data and computer simulations to make images like this. This allows our eyes to feel the change in the atmosphere. And then our body can feel the emerging weather. It's exactly this ability in our bodies that we have to cultivate. How do we see the invisible part of emergence in the system? How does our body become sensitive to it? So the different senses of our body, sound, touch, feeling, 
vision, all of this, how do those become sense-making tools for the invisible? So that was our brief little tour into atmospheric science. This is a, a very well-used metaphor for a good reason, the iceberg where all you can see is what's on the top. The thing is that this iceberg is a static image. It's an image in space. We're talking about seeing the invisible, but we're talking about seeing it unfold in time. The iceberg metaphor is about what you cannot see in space. You can see the top, there, there's a part of it below, but you can't see the part below because there's water there. But here I'm talking about the inability to see in time. What happened before that's causing this to happen now and what's gonna happen next? We need to learn how to see the invisible as it unfolds in time. And we have to do that as we experience it because it's our bodies that sense it. And our bodies can only sense what's happening now. See? And then if we get good at that, we can shape what happens next. If we can see the invisible with our bodies as it's unfolding in time, as we experience it, we can begin to make intentional choices about what we do next as part of the system to shape what it becomes. And now notice how I'm turning that image around. Instead of being scared and confused and anxious and stressed, now we feel excited, enticed, curious, open. Could we create the future? This is how we live into a collective dream. This is how. We make sense of the emerging patterns together and we each bring our own intentions to what we want it to become. And we begin to guide the parts that are unstable, guide the parts that have turbulence, guide the parts we cannot predict toward places that we need them to go. I'll give an example. I pull a lot of grass in the bio parking. As I pull the grass, I take all that loose clod and soil from the roots and I break it apart as I'm walking around and make a layer of mulch that's about this thick. Why do I do that? Because I know it's not going to rain for a while. I'm in the dry season. And when it does rain, I want the water to absorb into the ground instead of running off on a hard packed surface. So I'm shaping the future that I want. When the rains do come back, I want them to absorb into the ground. So I create a mulch layer. So as I'm experiencing this change from an invasive grass to an empty pile of mulch spread out across the land surface, I'm shaping the future interaction of what will happen when the rains come back. And how do I know it'll work? Because I pay attention with my body and I notice things about the system as I'm doing it and I become more familiar and more intimate. And this is where my metaphor of being a lover to the land becomes literal. I am giving love to the land and I am making love with the land, but it's not sexual. I'm making love. I'm making it possible for love to be expressed in the seeds of the native plants that will sit in that mulch layer and they too will wait for the rain. And the love that I will make will be the flowers from that plant that attract the bees. And the other insects and the birds and the reptiles that'll come to eat the bees and the wasps. I am making love, literally. I'm creating a space of loving, of thriving, of health and well-being for more and more participants by seeing the invisible unfold in time as I experience it and shaping what comes next. But notice I'm not doing it alone because I'm doing it with the dirt. I'm doing it with the microorganisms. I'm doing it with the rain. I'm doing it with the native seeds. I'm doing it with the pollinating insects. In time, what I'm doing now is related to the future relationship I will have with all of those beings. So we are collectively dreaming, even if I'm the only human doing it. Isn't that amazing? I'm in community alone. And those beings may not even be present yet. They may come a month from now when the rain comes. But if I come back every day, 
I will be there in that future moment experiencing their arrival, knowing what I did now. And this is how I participate in the collective dream with an ecosystem. We can do the same thing in human communities. So how do we grow these social tapestries that let us do this? We need to cultivate the soil within each human being, just as I'm cultivating the soil in my little food forest. We need to cultivate the emotional and psychological soil, the relationship soil within each human being, so that each of us can strengthen the regulation and flexibility of our own emotions, so that we can live more and more intentionally, which is what the pro-social process lets us do and what all mindfulness practices let us do. But we do this while relating ourselves to collective purpose. And we do this in pro-social groups. The example I just gave in the Bio Parque, my pro-social group is me together with all of those other ecological processes and living beings of that place. My pro-social group does not have to be human, but we also can do it in human groups. And we need to do it in human groups like we do on our community calls every week and like we do here in these webinars. We form a collective, we have shared purpose, and we build relationships, cultivating the soil within each of us. So this is a process of cultural evolution, which means it's dynamic. It's not staying the same. It's making ourselves forward fit, fit to the future that's emerging. It's cumulative meaning that we can build on what we did before and build on what we're doing now with whatever comes next as it emerges. It's adaptive. We continually make sense. We continually discern. We continually feel the emerging. And we change ourselves as the system is changing. It's responsive. If the system does something, we respond. If we do something, the system responds because we were never separate. And it's continual, which means if you can find peace, if you can find joy, if you can find contentment in this process, you'll always have it. It will become a bedrock in your life. And as I described in the webinar last week, when I've had a lot of isolation and loneliness and turbulence, I now have a continual partner in the land that I'm working with to hold me through my own turbulence. And I have pro-social relationships with other people in the Earth Regenerators community who hold me continually, who feed and nourish me continually as we're doing it all for each other. If we make this continual, we always have it. So, Notice how in the progression of this webinar, in the progression of these slides, I started us off with that scary, confusing, disorienting place, and then showed that it's our ability to feel that, that same ability to feel is what enables us to feel this. So what's really important is that we don't close off. We don't cling to false hope. We don't fall back into unhelpful patterns. We don't deny what is happening. We practice keeping ourselves open to what is changing and we learn to swim with the water. We learn to dance with the sound. We learn to move with the light and the shadow. And we learn to see the invisible as it's emerging. And I have an example, a living example of this. Back in October, I announced, we are creating the Earth Regenerators Fund. Bum, bum, it exists. How does it exist? Well, I put a couple notices up on Earth Regenerators and invited people to join. Who wants to help create it? And then we created a pro-social group. We started relating to each other around the idea of it. What is this Earth Regenerators Fund? What's its purpose? Who wants to be a part of it? How does it do it? How does it work? We established shared purpose together, but then, we very quickly distributed governance. Anyone who's helping create it is actually helping create it. And many of you don't know that 
I gave the governance team of this group a challenge at the beginning of this month. I said, we raised some money with crowdfunding. Here's $5,000, spend it fast. Give it to other members of Earth's Regenerators. Put out an invitation for people to submit proposals. Do it any way you want. And by the way, don't tell me how you're doing it. Don't ask me for help. Joe should not be the leader of this. You guys need to practice, go learn how. And they started exploring and learning. And as of this weekend, they are very, very close. They will either have given all the money away by February 1st, or they'll have one more week to just wrap up the loose ends. And that team has learned a ton because they started sensing into the system they were embedded in. What is the system? I'm a member of this community and I know and love these people and I wanna help these people. And we raised some money together among these people. And now we're giving it back to these people to support them in their lives and their projects. And we're doing it. I've already given money to one of the people who was approved last week and others are about to receive it. And we're doing this by feeling into and collectively sense-making. So that process I showed you earlier of seeing the system, feeling into its embeddedness, feeling its emergence, discerning, building scaffolding to each other. The governance team has been doing this for the last month. They've been posting announcements to all of you, but they might get lost in the newsfeed. So you may or may not have seen it because right now they're prototyping with $5,000, learning how to do it. And here's the thing, no one knows what they're gonna do next. They don't know, I don't know, you don't know, but we're gonna find out. We're gonna find out because they're about to share with us how they chose to distribute this money and who received it. And they're gonna share with us what they've learned. And as they share with us what they've learned, those of us who wanna join this learning process can join. There's a, a course, we just called it a course because it's got more functionality than a group. You can join the course called Creating the Earth Regenerators Fund, and you can participate in all of this. Go join right now if you want to. It's on Earth Regenerators. Or donate money to the fund and watch what they do, et cetera, et cetera. Because they are practicing exactly what we're talking about. This is not an academic exercise. Members of our community are doing this right now. How does it work? It works like this. There's a set of pro-social foundations that we have carefully and mindfully cultivated in the last two years of a growing web of human beings who can regulate their emotions and remain psychologically flexible and open as they practice devotional acts to themselves, to each other, and to the earth. They become social supports to each other and build healthy relationships with each other and healthy relationships with themselves. But they're continually making life choices. They're continually evolving themselves and evolving together. And this is what the process feels like and looks like. And this is what Earth Regenerators is, is a web of human beings living this out which is why it's really hard to say what Earth Regenerators is and why we're not an organization. No, we are not a 501c3 nonprofit in the United States. No, we're not a social impact business. No, we're not a cooperative. Yes, we are elements of all of those things. But what we actually are is this intentional evolutionary process of human bodies making sense of the world together. That's what we are. And that's what the host team is each week as we pay attention to what's happening in the webinars and the community calls to figure out what needs to happen next. That's how this topic today came into being for this webinar. I don't even know what the next webinar will be. Maybe it'll be for social, we'll find out. We'll find out with you because all of you are part of the system. So see, the key to cultural regeneration the foundation of it all is pro-social groups. Who knew, right? Who knew it was pro-social groups that are the foundation of it all. And our job is to hospice and compost the death of empires that is inevitable and is already happening. 
the US empire, 40 years into its collapse. The British empire, post-collapse. The globalized economy, mid-collapse, right? Hospice means we honor the dying process and we honor what we love, that which is dying. If I hospice my mother, and I did, I hospice my mother 10 years ago, I bear witness to her death and she does not die alone. And she dies knowing that I see her continually through the pain and the loss of her as different parts of her shut down. Can you do that for civilization? Can you do that for the globalized economy? Can you do that for your story of your career? Can you do it for your story of who you thought you were going to be? Compost means that the nutrients that were structured and entrenched become broken down and released and become circulation for growing new life. Regeneration. The next generation is what is recirculating those nutrients of that decomposition. Compost is decomposition. And we do this while we learn how to thrive as part of the earth, which is the process we're talking about today. How does it feel to thrive? Well, how does it feel for me to pull that grass and prepare that mulch? I feel pretty good. I'm thriving and so is that landscape. It, the way it feels is to be present to what is emerging and to guide it with love. That's what thriving is. And that's what regeneration feels like. And so, here's that picture again from the Mandelbrot set. Somewhere back there, these patterns started forming and they're spreading outward and we're in this chaotic dance of the cosmos. Yet we have human bodies capable of sensing and feeling and socially connecting with the dance of the cosmos. And so we can dance beautifully. We can create beauty and love in the way we dance with these emerging patterns. And so that webinar went a little long. Maybe we'll go a little over the hour if we wanna have more discussion. Apologies for making that a longer presentation than I had intended. But this for me is how we navigate emergence together. How does it feel? Questions, comments, reflections. You can use the reaction button to raise a hand or you can just raise your hand visibly, although I can't see everyone on the screen. So maybe the hand raising is a better way to go. Hmm. Questions or comments, emotional churnings, discernment. What are you feeling? Stephen, please. Um, I don't know that I have words yet, and I'm a little reluctant to put labels to the feelings. Um, I know I've found the right place. And I've said that before in my life, so I'm clear it's the right place for the right time. <laughs> and who knows where the next place will be, which I think you emphasize very well. Um, I'm continually blown away by what's presented in your webinars and how res deeply resonant I feel with it. So thank you. I, I think of my closest friends right now kind of know something's off, but I can't relate to them the way I've related to some of the people here in this community. And the whole emergence process that you painted out lets me let go of the worry about those relationships. Like they will emerge and evolve in their own way. And I don't need to try to go convert or recruit or proselytize. Live my life, share when I can, 
be curious on what's going on with them. And who knows, I, I think of one conversation I had last night with, with a friend of mine who just got so mental and conceptual. It's like, we could solve all the problems in the world if we picked one at a time and got everyone to agree on what to do. And I said, yeah, but that's not the way the world works. He says, I don't care. People told me that it would work if we did it this way. And at some point I just, you know, it became a fun sparring, but it was like no real change was going to, that I could see was going to come out of that conversation, but who knows what that impact might have on him or our continual engagement. Yeah. Um, so it was kind of, it's nice to hear this after that kind of example of how, he was an extreme example of how people think their idea of how to solve the problems is going to work if everyone else would just do it. Yeah. I mean, he couldn't, he, he, he sort of, he, when I said, well, no, you've got 7 billion people. You're not going to get even a small fraction of them to agree on the right way because there is no right way. Um, I got practice in speaking clearly what my truth was and just listening to somebody who I thought was full of shit. <laughs> That's a and good still example. love and still love him in the process. Yeah, that's a good example of clinging to a false hope and falling back to an old habit. Yeah. Um, I never thought of that. Of those. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, I see that uh, Tove and Joy have their hands raised and then Langdon, Amy. But before all of that, Amy had posted a question in the chat. So Amy, I'd love to bring your question forward first, if we could. Would you like to speak to it or shall I read it? What do you prefer? Sure, I'll say something. Um, you know, I guess I, as I get older, I trust people less. And I trust systems less. Like, you know, crypto is a great example. And honestly, one of the things that's happened to me recently is following down the game B and some of these other um, thinkers you're probably familiar with and lots of people here are familiar with, listening to some of their longer form interviews and things. And having people that I really was like, oh, they're brilliant. We got to we gotta listen to them say things. And I was like, no, that part is wrong. Totally bad. And just being like, how could I think they're so brilliant? And then they think this is part of the solution. And, you know, then there's the thing of charisma and there's the thing of celebrity or, you know, sort of cult of personality kind of thing that comes in too. And so... I would call, for me personally, I would say right now what crypto and Bitcoin and all those kind of things look like because of their environmental price tag are a, a false hope or a, a, a game A solution that might, you know, might be a bridge, but it's really not going to be a solution. Ultimately, we got to figure out something else. And so can you just speak to things like, I would call that a false scaffolding or a temporary scaffolding that needs to only be temporary for a very short time and or the whole thing of personality being bigger than the values itself or having a hard time coalescing around values because certain voices are louder, stronger, more bullish, whatever. Yeah, this is a super important topic that would be nice to, um, <clears throat> to weave into the community calls somehow. Uh, the, just this exploration in general of how do we know when we're entering into things that are not only not helpful, but are actually have side effects that are destructive, but they appear to be good. Like a lot of the electric car stuff is like that. Do you know where the lithium comes from? It, it's coming from, uh, from seafloor mining. Like they're gonna mine the ocean floor. That's Tesla's long-term business strategy is to mine the ocean floor for Tesla's car sales. And so, yeah, and you're like, oh yeah, that's an environmental solution. Oh wait. And so this is a really important realm, this realm of the contingencies the negative contingencies. Um, the negative externalities is one of the terms that's used in economics for this. And what I would say about scaffolding is I focus on development in scaffolding, developmental entrenchment, because it's got a direction. You can see a realm of possibilities being closed off and another realm of possibilities being moved toward. And you can see what is adjacent, you know, what is nearby, and now that opens and closes by watching that entrenchment process. And I find that really helpful to try to answer these kinds of questions of like, if we go in that direction, what are the contingencies? What's pulled along with it? And those things that are pulled along with it, what are the consequences of those things? 
including if we used up these resources there so they're no longer available for something else and we've run out of time because this other thing was happening in parallel. So you can also look at this sort of like parallel tracks of patterns too, to be like, well, while that's happening in this industry, this is happening to the Arctic Ocean or whatever other pattern you wanna look at. And so, um, so I think the real key is that the system it has nestedness to it. And we just need to practice going out. It's helpful to start just by going up one level. Look at the level of the conversation as it is and go up one level. Include the next level up. And I found this to be an extremely useful strategy for finding all kinds of systemic blind spots. Like just going up one level, most people don't do, let alone whatever the whole system might be, which is usually more than that. Um, so, what do you mean by going up one level? Can you give a quick example? Well, like a simple example would be uh, if you identify a problem with an individual, like so-and-so is an alcoholic, let's go up to the level of them and their immediate peer network and say, okay, what kinds of behaviors are reinforced among them and their, and their friends or their, their spouse or their family? And you go up one level in social organization and you start to see different patterns that are shaping their context. So what I mean by go up one level is you have some level of focus and you say, well, those are interdependent with something more. What is the level that goes to something more? So if you're talking about human beings, it's human beings and their immediate relationships would be one example. And that, that's what I'm getting at. And you could do that with like uh, the automobile industry. Well, now let's go up to uh, manufacturing or supply chains or some other larger scale. So whatever level you're at, you go up a level. And it's just a, a useful way of starting to see more of the system. Um, so is it Tove? Is that how you say it? Please let me know because I've never said your name before. But please, on to you. Uh, yes, you say Tove. Yeah. Not Tove, like, like a lot of people. You say all the letters. So, uh, okay, thank you. I was just reflecting over what you said. Uh, we need to stay psychologically flexible and tying that into what Stephen was talking about. And it reminds me of that when you talk about that we're stuck in the system. So of course the infrastructure is a part of that, the culture is a part of that, but we're also stuck in our own heads because of neuroscience, it's biological because the patterns that has formed in our brain from our growing up and our cultures and all the things that we have experienced in life it's not so easy to break out of. You need to understand that it's like that. You need to experience the, the, uh, the consequence of that. And when you do that, you, you can be more able to consciously break out of your patterns. So, so that's what I'm, you know, when you meet other people that they just can't understand and follow your logic is because their brain is, is just following habitual patterns and they just don't get it and it takes a while and uh, so just forgive them and just know that yeah That's when I back when I worked with George Lakoff um, there's one thing he would like to say which was changing minds is changing brains and then you go one step further and say to change your behavior you have to actually grow new synapses and the, the lesson there is it takes work, time, and energy. It's not automatic, <laughs> which very much relates to what you're saying. It's a, super important. Is that part of the entrenchment is actually in the structure and the patterns of connectivity in our brains, um, which means that changing consciousness is physically changing your brain. That is literally true, like literally true. And so you have to do work on the system. Um, so yeah, thank you for that, Tove. Super important. Um, Joy, on to you. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you so much. This is my second month-ish in Earth Regenerators. I'm thoroughly enjoying myself um, and the relationships that are showing up for me. And um, it's, been, it's been quite a journey and also a joyful one. Um, one of the things that I've been longing, Joe, to hear uh, more on in these contexts is uh, inner work. Mm -hmm. And it's multidimensional, right? Like you, you've touched on emotional and psychological aspects of, of our being. And then of course, skills and everything changes the body uh, and mind. But I'm, I'm, 
I'm longing and I, it's, it's a sincere longing uh, is the, the connection to spirituality. And the reason I'm bringing this up is you've talked about emergence, right? The other piece of emergence in, in my own being I hold um, is the flow. Mm, yeah. and, and to be in the flow is to know how to be one with the system, which you've touched on. Uh, but there are like multiple layers to that and and my and I'm taking a moment to to honor the sacredness of that is is to be able to know what to say what to think what to say and what to do to be in that alignment opens up the channel to for you to become for that flow to to sense into the land, to sense into the cosmos, wherever, right? Like those three. And that alignment, thought, word, and deed, that alignment is spiritual for me. And it's sacred. And that's how land becomes sacred. Humans mm -hmm. become sacred. My very silence becomes sacred. The relationships become sacred. Um, I'm, I'm longing to see or to, I'm not saying it's not here. I'm sensing it. Of course, I'm sensing it. That's why, the, that's where the joy is coming from. Um, I'm longing to hear more on it. So, because at the end of the day, if all the systems fail, which, you know, which is not going to happen, that's not the nature of systems. It's the sacredness that it's going to retain. That's what earth has been. It's sacred. And that's that sacredness has lived on for billions of years. Yeah. And, and that truly, that's that's what, uh, <laughs> thank you for letting me voice yeah. this. I've been sitting with it. Um, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. And I just want to name for the sake of time that we are at the hour if anyone needs to go. There will be a recording of this so you can catch what you've missed if you need to go. But um, we, since we have, uh, I'd love to give a quick response to this and then hear from the two who have their hands raised. Um, so we might just go for a few more minutes. And so I'm um, just, just naming the process there. And Joy, what I was feeling from that is that what you're describing here, what you're drawing attention to, for me is like the source from which and to which this work flows to say where it goes, where it comes from as both at the same time. And that for me, um, I've gone through my own journey of spirituality that has included rejecting religions at an earlier stage in time and then discovering and clarifying the difference between being religious and being spiritual and coming back and recovering different elements of the religions that were spiritual and you know, all of that that a lot of people do on their spiritual journeys. And where I've come to in that as a sort of elegant simplicity is there's a way of being present to how I'm relating. It's not how I'm relating, it's how I'm relating to how I'm relating. It's how I'm present to how I'm relating, which includes when I'm not relating well. And this is something that has really become clear for me with the pro-social process. And something I was just giving a webinar on yesterday uh, to uh, a wonderful group of people here in Colombia of how we can create this space between noticing and acting. And the space between noticing and acting is where our spirituality gets expressed. It's the place where I notice that I was being negligent, where I noticed that I was being rude, where I noticed that I was being judgmental, where I noticed I was being kind, where I just notice whatever was happening and create a space for it. And what is, what's beautiful about the sacred in that is that it, um, we can feel a sense of you know, right relationship and the way that it would be talked about in spiritual traditions. I'm giving a course because I'm just not gonna define it now, to be in right relationship, because um, it means so many different things in different contexts, but to be in right relationship with how I'm relating. Um, so, so yeah, it's just something that uh, I think is super important and that I know we'll continue exploring as we go along. And as Stephen has said in the chat, the, um, the early webinar on scaffolding does explore this some. 
but we'll continue exploring it further. Uh, to, on to Amy and Lyndon, whichever or both of you would like to speak. Ah, oh, so, uh, <laughs> hmm, so many things to just happened before, since I put my hand up, hard to remember what I was going to say. But um, one thing I want to speak to is just the recognition of, of just the, the, you know, the level of trauma we have all been through and that we're all in, in this moment. And the, the value of just creating this safe space to explore who we are and to change our minds and to, to be vulnerable. Um, and one thing I, I just want to recognize is that um, I, I find myself, I get impatient <laughs> quite a lot, um, you know, and what I, one of the things I get impatient about is just all the different ways that people bypass, including myself, and a lot of it comes from this state of learned helplessness that our trauma induces, you know, in, in, in a state of learned helplessness, we're falsely disempowered. And we believe that we really have very limited capacity to make change. And so we do things like we talk about what should happen, like you were, you were saying, even though we know it's not going to, or we come up with these very simplistic ideas of, oh, technology will save us, or Native American wisdom will save us, or, you know, just tuning in and meditating and feeling the, the truth of the universe, that'll save us. It's like, well, all those things are actually very, very useful and necessary. You know, those three I mentioned and many more, but none of those are the answer because we're in this place, as you said, that there's, wow, we have no idea <laughs> what we're going to need because what it, this, this challenge is so much bigger than any challenge humanity has faced before. And it's, it's the cultural evolution, but it's also the personal evolution that is so necessary. And it's the, the relationship between the two. Mm -hmm. And just to say that there's, you know, it feels like, you know, I spend a lot of time with <laughs> earth regenerators and wish I would, could spend more. And, you know, it, it's, it seems like the, the healing that's necessary, it's, it's more than just like a week of therapy every uh, you know, uh, you know, an hour of therapy every week. That that whole model that comes from capitalism is not going to work. You know, somebody through putting the thread about psychedelics is like, well, yeah, great tool. Psychedelics, neurofeedback, somatic psychotherapy, group practice, all of it, and you know, <laughs> many, many hours. Yes, the end. Yes, the end. <laughs> you know, that's what we need. Um, you know, and and this and this is just such a wonderful healing tool. Um, just greatly appreciate all of you um, showing up here, just to to be here and and be vulnerable and say, yeah, I, I don't know, I, I I know some things, but I really don't know what's next. So um, together, I just hope that we'll we'll find our way. Yeah. Thank you, Lingden. Uh, ben, on to you, please. Thank, thank you very much for this nice webinar and also for the, um, for the conversation. Um, my question is, how, how comes it that um, so many people uh, seem to not recognize uh, this entrenchment um, of collapse because um, I have this feeling this earth regeneration idea which I really like and uh, is not only about um, or there are two dimensions of this of this huge problem which I if I understand it correctly uh, and one dimension is the yeah social dimension how we act um, with uh, to each other between each other and the other dimension is the yeah the hard facts like the effects on the earth systems and um, so I would definitely agree to you uh, that we are entrenched in in the collapse um, but I'm asking myself how how it comes that. I, as an 
not extraordinarily smart person um, seem to recognize it and uh, so many smart people like so many intellectuals and uh, the yeah, mainstream media too and um, sometimes I'm asking myself how how is it possible that um, or sometimes I'm questioning myself for um, if, if I'm on the on some sort of wrong path or something like that and I wondered um, about your opinion or all of your opinions on that and the, the second thing is um, all these things you talked about with the flow and the emergence and um, to let to let it flow and to know that there are things that are building up without um, without conscious want <laughs> that that it builds up. Um, how it how this is practicable? Like if it if it's useful to try it in several different social groups, uh, because I don't find it easy to to interact in social groups. So it's definitely a thing um, that has to be practiced. And I think this flow and emergence uh, project is are, exists on different layers, I guess. And one of these layers are the immediate. Um, community groups so that yeah that's that that's my these are my questions yeah I, I think the two questions are related in an interesting way which is that um i'm one of the the thinkers in cognitive science that influenced me for this is a guy named andy clark who wrote like the standard textbook on the philosophy of cognitive science which is the name of the book and um which came out in the early 90s, but it's still like a solid foundation to start from. Um, it's not dated in that sense. It's a very useful beginning place to learn cognitive science. And one of the things that he did is he took the idea of the cyborg and generalized it in a very interesting way, which is, you know, if I'm using my phone, part of my brain and part of my mind is in an information structure of dynamics that causes part of my mind to be in this device and part of this device to be in my mind. And they took that sort of an insight and applied it in general and said, really, we have this thing, he called it the social mind. And the social mind is the aspect of your mind that arises from the scaffolding to and the scaffolding from the world, which includes other minds. So you and I are in a scaffolding right now by having a conversation and having an exchange of ideas where I will build upon what you said. And if you were to speak back, you would build upon what I said. And our minds are melded in this social space. And part of my mind is in the, the emerging flow of that conversation. And so that, that observation, that part of our mind is an emergent pattern with the world outside of our bodies. And that the straight, the shape and the dynamic and the relations of that larger environment shape what mind I have that will both reinforce the normalcy of false truth. Like the people who believe everything's going along just fine and technology can fix us. They are just continually being reinforced by a shared social mind space. But if you leave that social mind space and become incongruent with it, it becomes problematic for you. You start to feel social panic, isolation, self-doubt, a phenomenon called gaslighting, which is that you increasingly question and doubt your own judgment and think you might be going crazy, which can go to a pretty extreme place. And so part of what this work is about is about creating robust or credible or valid or legitimate sense-making in the space of our social mind, which is where my mind is melded into yours and your mind is melded into mine, is the sense making there actually helpful for real problems that we have. And a nice concrete example of that is when our host team meets every Tuesday to talk about the three Zoom calls and the webinar, are we basing our conversation in anything related to what actually happened? And does it actually help 
to create a scaffolding to the next step from what we observed. There's a social mind there. There's a co-creative or a collaborative process. So that's just like one example. But there are a lot, I'm just wanting to give a quick example that was easy to draw upon, but there are lots of examples of this. And I think that part of our challenge in finding our way into the future is that we sort of bump along I like, you know, floating, like floating leaves in the stream, being carried by the currents that are larger than us. And we might be an awake leaf floating in stream, which just makes us frustrated, until we learn how to swim, until we learn how to navigate, until we learn how to read by the stars and do wayfinding, you know, until we do other more advanced things. And um, a lot of what we're talking about with these social supports and cultural scaffolding is those kinds of capacities. I, I'm limited in my ability to do sense making. Thank goodness I speak English and can read the scientific literature and have almost a decade of, of university education, including being trained as a scientist. So I can read a lot of scientific publications and draw knowledge from them. Because I had all of this cultural scaffolding that I built upon before to enable me to do that and all this existing informational scaffolding that I can go and search through to do sense-making from the sense-making of thousands and thousands and thousands of other researchers. And if I have a process that accumulates good sense-making, which is what the scientific method does when it's working, when the scientific method is working, it accumulates legitimate findings and it increases the quality and credibility of both knowledge and interpretation or of data and interpretation, which creates knowledge. And so when the scientific method is working well, which has a number of different elements, so it can, it can turn bad, but when it's working well, it accumulates. And so we need cumulative cultural evolution in our sense-making in the social mind space. And so we can ask ourselves, we're in week four of this learning journey, is that happening? Do we have cumulative quality of sense-making among us? So that's a reality check. Like, Okay, the host team and me, we're here doing this. You guys are all participating. Is our collective sense making going up? Do you feel like your sense making is going up by participating in this process? Like these are body based reality checks, and we should do them. Because just because Joe's a smart, eloquent guy doesn't mean you should trust everything I say. You know, it's like we are collectively sense making, and everyone is fallible. But if our cultural evolutionary process is cumulative sense-making, then we're gonna generally speaking improve at how we do it. And if each of us individually is practicing, we will each contribute to a collective process, which by the way is what science does. Anyone who's training as a researcher should be getting better at sense-making if they're being trained well. So, and they should accumulate to better knowledge as they check each other's methods and each other's data. And that's, and that's a big part of how that process works. So um, I realize- can I, Yeah, please. Can I quickly respond, respond to that? Um, because um, I, I'm wondering, we have this amazing um, scientific method and um, I have a huge respect for, for the cities and all the knowledge, but still I have this feeling that all these things with a pro-social, um, with this pro-social idea and all what you, everything you said about the psychological um, facts with, with the context and um, also the, this, the scientific method um, related to this whole ecological topic, um, I'm wondering because I have this feeling people who are radically saying like you with this entrenchment and in, in collapse, even among the scientists are still the min minority, you know, and um, I think it's very obvious <laughs> that uh, the way society works um, is not um, sustainable and from there you get all the following problems with the psychological layer and everything around it. Um, but how 
can this be? I mean, <laughs> if the, this if this scientific method is so powerful, how how comes it that still most of the scientists, for example, the IPCC, um, seems to not get get it right in in its um, um, <laughs> concrete uh, or in its uh, final in its in its final uh, you know what, <laughs> what I try yeah, to yeah. stumble in here. <laughs> I, I, I see where you're going with this and this relates to what Amy and I were talking about a few minutes ago which is we need to go to one level higher so the IPCC is a nice example the IPCC is a is a political process first and a scientific process second the scientific process is all of the peer review research that's happening and all the research centers like the UK Met Office and NCAR, et cetera, et cetera. But the IPCC says things like, we will do ensemble forecasting. What does that mean? That means every nation that participates in the IPCC can submit their climate model from their research center and they weight them evenly. They weight them evenly. Even though the scientific communities, so that's a political decision. Even though the scientific community says, well, you know, the two best models in the world are the one that NCAR has and the one that UK Met Office has. And so if we just use those instead of the 150 or so that are in the ensemble, we actually get better forecasts. But for political reasons of inclusion, the IPCC includes all of them equally. And that's just one example. There are plenty of other things I could say about the IPCC as a political process where you have highly credible scientists doing very good work and still that's structurally biased because of the politics of the IPCC. It's, it's a United Nations um, bureaucratic process. The other thing I would say is that one thing that complex systems do is they create splintering, fragmentation, and modularity. And this is important for the way that knowledge has been built up because if you've ever gone to a university and thought about getting a PhD, or if any of you here have gotten one or helped someone else to get one, you see how specialized it becomes and how you become the extreme version of the three blind men and the elephant. And so science is, or actually I would say just the institutions of academia and the institutions of research and the institutions of knowledge creation writ large are not structured around interdisciplinarity and even less so around transdisciplinarity. Interdisciplinarity is when you get the different disciplines to talk to each other. Transdisciplinarity is when you integrate them to create something new. And then there's multidisciplinarity. See, like all these different places in between where we can just see the gradation of how we fail to do it. And so the reason why your amazingly talented astrophysicist is terrible at psychology is because they've never even taken one psychology class. So we shouldn't be surprised. And and the same is true in every direction across that whole realm of knowledge. So what you need is you need generalists who are transdisciplinary synthesizers, who, who basically meander across many different fields looking at what is convergent. And as they look for what is convergent, they do increasingly good sense-making in general. And notice this is not the crackpot conspiracy theorist on the internet. You're still validating your sources, going to primary materials, et cetera, et cetera. You're doing good research, but your purpose is to synthesize across the silos. And so, um, so just naming that, but that is not generally done and it is heavily selected against by academia. Look at me, I don't have a PhD. I tried a few times. There was never a place for me because I'm a transdisciplinary synthesizer. And I'm good at academic studies. My grades are good at, you know, doesn't matter. Anyone who's a transdisciplinary synthesizer is deeply frustrated at universities. Or they find a little niche and make it work and they're the exception. Um, I'm sure some of you here can relate to this from your own lives. <laughs> um, I know that we're now 25 minutes past the time that we'd agreed to, and this is getting long. And I also know that Chris raised his hand. And so I'd love to just for the sake of inclusion and say, Chris, you got something to say, bring it. So I'd love to hear from you, Chris. And then I'd love to wrap up after that because we're gonna to get to talk more on the community calls. So this will continue. But Chris, Yeah, please. this is not that subject. Um, yeah, that's doesn't. huge. It's like, why do, why do humans do things essentially is what he's asking. Um, 
<laughs> uh, but I, I, I guess I'm uh, wanting to maybe just do like some, just say back to you what I think I'm hearing overall, basically, and see if I'm getting this, essentially. It's like, we're talking about healing ourselves and healing culturally so that we can bring forth something different, something better. And then we need to get into how do we do that? How do we support each other? What do we do? And up to this point, it's it's been kind of like laying the context and laying the foundation of like, here's why we need to do that. Here's a lot of the context of how we how we got to be in this place to begin with. And I don't mean like the state of the world. I mean like the cultural scaffolding and like how is an how is a self formed? How is a person become a person? And and what goes into that? And so. I mean, this for me, the, the biggest teaching and like you reference a lot that I've experienced is just having children and getting to getting to revisit. Yeah. Getting to revisit that entire process of what of how a person becomes a person. And then you, it, it's just constantly illuminating for myself of. Wow, this this is what happened to me. This is how you know, this is how these things come together. This is how just the language itself forms your reality and then like how your parents were able to cope with their situation everything so it's like um i in stuff that i'm working on there's a lot of um the idea of like reparenting each other reparenting ourselves um that i'm, I'm seeing a lot of overlap with that in this in this work um it sounds very similar um, so I just, that's what I'm getting out of this so far. And I'm really, I'm really excited and interested to get into the, the nitty gritty, you know, like you referencing the fund that you did, like, these are things that are based in this work and then actually doing stuff to move in that direction. Yeah. Um, I'm yeah, really like excited. Lillian and Lyndon are both part of that team, uh, doing some of that work. So like, yeah, it's, it's present. It's like, um, you could, you could talk to Lilian or Langdon right away and say, Hey, so what's it like when you're in that group? And then you can join the group. Um, <laughs> they'll, they'll love to have you, but <laughs> you'll be a great addition. Um, so I think you have your summary back is a really nice summary. I think you've captured it really well. It's that the surprising thing about regenerating the earth is how much we have to focus on healing ourselves. Like that's the surprising part. And there's a story I learned when I first came to Columbia of a place where there was a really polluted river, which is basically every river in Latin America, as far as I can tell. All the rivers here are dead. There's not a single living river where I live. Um, if there's water in it, it's contaminated and you can't fish in it. And most of them don't even have water. So like they're dead, dead, dead. Um, but there was this place where there was this contaminated river and everyone gathered and they brought a Kogi Mamo, which is a shaman from the Kogi tradition. Um, for those of you who know the story of little brother in Santa Marta in the heart of the world, these are the Kogi people. Anyway, they brought this Kogi mama and everyone's talking for like three or four days about all that's wrong or all that's wrong with the river. And the Kogi shaman just says, there's nothing wrong with the river. Like what? He says, there's nothing wrong with the river. And they like, look at it, measure it, smell it. It's, there's something wrong with it. He's like, there's nothing wrong with the river. The problem is in the consciousness of the people. And it's because they learn from a very young age that you can measure the consciousness of the people and they do this. When they arrive in town, they go to the river and they look at the health of the river and they will tell you the ethical quality and ethical maturity of the people who live there. They will tell you. They will just say, it's right there, look at your river. You guys shit in your river. What's your level of consciousness? And so, and literally that's what happens here in Barichara. 
all yeah, we're of, collectively sh shitting in the river. That's we're collectively shitting in the river. And then when we realize that it's our conscience that's shitting in the river, then we know where to do the regenerative work. All right, we'll clean up that river by cleaning up ourselves first. And how do we clean up ourselves? Part of it is regenerating the land and the river. That's part of it. Absolutely, that physical manifestation is part of it. But if we don't know that it was us all along, and by the way, it wasn't our fault. Can you accept that? Like, that's a tough one to swallow. It's not your fault. We were born into pathological cultures without elders. No one taught us better. And we're doing our very best. But now that we know what to do, we get to it. And that's it. And the thing is that we're not going to be finished with this in eight weeks. You can see that. Like, there's no way. It would be ludicrous to claim that. The idea is this is the work for the next 200 to 500 years, which means we need to keep humans from going extinct before then. And by the way, to regrow biodiversity is a million years. A million minimum to restore the biodiversity that's been lost. So. We can stabilize the planet and avoid human extinction maybe in the next hundred years, but we need a million years to bring the biodiversity back. And that means we need 200 to 500 years to move us into a different climatic trajectory. All right, so we're, I'm just giving you realistic context here. And so this is the work of lifetimes and we're not even the ones starting it. I mean, I've read my Aldo Leopold. I've read my other elders of previous generations. You know, like, we're not even the ones starting it. We're just at this place in it. And that's why we need to embed ourselves in the system and feel it's emerging. And get and become really good sense-making parts. When, in my book, um, for those of you who read it, I call this uh, Becoming Gaia Consciousness. Of course, I'm also not the only person to say that. But like, yeah, what is Gaia Consciousness? The planet has a self the planet is a self-regulatory living system. We are part of that living system. We become awake. We become awake parts of that living system. And we guide the part that we touch, which might mean restoring a river, protecting a forest, restoring soils, creating resilient local food systems, creating sustainable housing cultural healing. There are a million different ways we're gonna do it. But that's what we're talking about. When I say feel the system emerging, what I'm saying is be Gaia consciousness, just without having that hokey new age feel to it. Not that it's necessarily there, but you know, someone could just brush it off like that. Like, oh, you're planetary conscious, it's not, you're an idiot. And I'm like, no, that's someone who doesn't understand what consciousness is. It's a sense-making part of the living universe, of which we are. And so um, to wrap us to a close, because I know more and more people are needing to leave now, and we've been here for an hour and a half, that um, <clears throat> the felt purpose of this webinar was that we could feel in the host team that a lot was stirred up and that the entering into the unknown was stirring up feelings that we needed to create a pathway for. And we felt that this topic today would help give it a direction to express. And I feel it being expressed in the discussion now. And I feel it's going to be expressed in the community calls in the next few days. And what I invite you to do is to feel into how you feel into. Feel into how you feel into. Don't just be confused and stressed, anxious and confused. That's feeling into. Feel how you feel into. Why do you feel anxious or stressed? Why do you feel calm? Why do you feel connected? Why do you feel disconnected? However you're feeling into it, how does that feel? That's the next level up. And so just meditate on that a little bit. Maybe you watch the movie, Don't Look Up. Maybe you're looking at newscasts. Maybe like some of the things that Merit's posting right now about possible uh, tra trajectories for climate change. How do you feel when you notice those things? How do you feel as you're feeling into the system changing? 
That'll help you increase your consciousness of it just a little bit more. And that's what we need. Humans do this unlike any other being in the history of this planet. And whether we like it or not, we're special in this way. Whether we like it or not, it makes us responsible to use this ability. And so with that in mind, thank you for practicing it with me in the last hour and a half. We felt into a lot of emergence in 90 minutes. Go take a walk, take a warm bath, do whatever you need to do, let this absorb and settle. Give yourself a break, this is pretty intense. We've just done a lot of work here. And if any of you would like to talk to me personally at any time, just reach out. Reach out to any member of the host team. Reach out to any member of the community. We're all here for each other. And we're not in this alone. We are in it together. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, Joe. Oh, in the recording now.